time? Yep. Yeah, we're good. Okay. All right, so uh, it's good to be with you today from Snowy Fort Collins. Hopefully this is going to work fine and um, be able to get through this on a remote basis. Uh, when Ron called me, Ron Goat called me to uh, present, um, I told him this was about the only way I would be able to do this with school starting this week, and, um, and so hopefully this will work out for everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about cover crops today, and particularly um, how they relate to you know, being able to use some of those cover crops as uh, forages for livestock. So myself and my graduate student, Luis Villalobos, uh, uh, we've been working on some uh, uh, projects with brassicas, and I'll talk about those a little later in the presentation. But I was also at the um, Western Alpha Forage Conference back in December, <laughs> And uh, some of my colleagues from the University of Idaho had a really nice presentation on a number of other cover crops and uh, how they were, you know, looking at those again from my forage uh, livestock um, utilization standpoint. So I was able to uh, borrow uh, their presentation and kind of mail all the two presentations from the two universities together. So Christy Fallon, Lord Hunter, and Clay Shoemaker, and Amber Form, they did most of the work there in, in Idaho that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so next slide. Okay. So I'm sure you've already heard um, in some of the previous presentations today that um, some of the benefits of, of cover crops, um, how they can improve, you know, soil fertility and you know, soil health type factors. Um, so I'm not going to be spending time or much time on talking about any of those. Uh, next slide. But when you think about a lot of the cover crops, the crops that have been talked about, um, many of those can be used as crops and produce high quality forage as well. So when you think about a lot of the soil benefits that we're after when we use cover crops, you know, previously listed on that uh, previous slide, you can also utilize those for, for dual purpose as feed for livestock. So, you know, we're, a lot of times we're using cover crops right after the nutrients and, and nutrient scavenging and those types of things. But when you think about an animal, uh, a cow, for example, they're out there grazing on some of these crops. About you know, 85 to 90 percent of the nutrients from that forage that they consume is redeposited back in the soil and grain and dung. So we're really not removing a large amount of nutrients through the grazing process. I mean, same token for providing the feed for the livestock. So to kind of help with the, you know, the redeposition of the nutrients, you know, an animal's rather grazing, we need to use some kind of a rotational or strict grazing approach to kind of concentrate those animals and get a better distribution of that overall manure across the, the field of the landscape there. And one of the biggest drawbacks that I see personally grazing some of these the crops it's the potential for soil compaction. Especially some of our soils that have high uh, content, um, soils are wet when the animals are out there with some soil compaction. So those are just, that's been the biggest drawback or concern you think about when you're trying to raise some of these crops. All right, next, next slide. So I've just kind of broken some of these the potential species that we can use for forages and, and cover into like four general categories. Cool season annual grasses. It's like uh, triticale, wheat, barley, certain pie, bitter bowl stand, and by the oak. Um, I'm really a big fan of triticale as well as oak. You like utilization as far as forage. There's a number of different warm season annual grasses, things like pellets uh, and pearl millet would be examples. Uh, Sudan grass or Sudan grass uh, hybrids. Almost the sort of Sudan grass hybrid, which is probably the most common. The teff, which is another one that sees in is from Ethiopia, which kind of pretty new on the scene, but it, and uh, fairly drought tolerant, is uh, pretty cool in a lot of systems in Colorado. Uh, the brassicas, mustard family, uh, it's like turnips, uh, rape, rape, kale, uh, the grape seed, very similar to, you know, forage type grapes, radishes, and utility radishes, or hybrids of some of these uh, types of brassica species. And the last group there would be, be uh, some legumes, 
use things like field keys, both mighty spring type committees, patches, and carry pads, shut it, and for some of them just we can use. Uh, we don't use a lot of annual clovers in Colorado. Bursting uh, or crimson type clovers uh, will grow here. They're just not as very common as they are in some of the south and southeast US. Another clover you might think about is you know, red clover. Even though it's a short lived perennial type of species, it does come up pretty quick and can so significant in the bottom of the period of time. Okay, next slide. So, some of the specific benefits that we can maybe um, garner from some of these different uh, general categories of uh, cover crops. Lagoons, uh, the big one would be the fish. So they've got the rhizobacterium effect, so it boots up the lagoons and picks the, the, the nitrogen from the atmosphere, getting the free source of nitrogen, towards a big advantage for using lagoon cover crops. When we think about the green grasses, they tend to have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, so they're going to be a better job providing organic matter, building metal, organic matter in the soil. Especially if you think about farm um, season type grasses, they can provide large amounts of organic back to the soil. Grasses with their nitrogen system, um, so very good at scavenging nutrients, especially I always describe them as sponges for nitrogen. Uh, the brassica type industries, again, also very good at scavenging of those nutrients in the soil. They also contain compounds that are uh, good at suppressing weeds, a number of the weed species, as well as pests, the insect pests, some uh, soil form pests like the um, When I think about from a grazing perspective, uh, the brassicas either have you know, some type of a bowl or a taproot on them. So when you think about that soil compaction issue that I mentioned earlier, like you know, the radishes, the kitchen stuff, including the nose and some of the mixes, reduce the incidence of soil compaction. Right, next, next slide. So I'm gonna just, I know you can see me, we can't see you right now, but we're having, we're just getting you a little bit sketchy right now, so I don't know if there's anything that we can do to help on your side or not, but you are coming in just a little bit broken as you're speaking. Does, do we sound okay coming from your side? Um, there's nothing that I can do, I don't think. Okay, well, well, we'll continue to limp along. I just wanted to let you know we are having just a little bit of hard time. You're breaking up just a little bit as you're going through this, so we'll try and keep up with you. Yeah, sometimes that's due to the Wi-Fi uh, type of connection, so. Okay, go ahead. The lagoon cover crops. Uh, the big thing there is, again, the nitrogen contribution. That can range anywhere from you know 60 up to upwards of 200 pounds of nitrogen fixed per acre. So again, that's a big uh, advantage to using those in the in a cover crop system. Things like hairy patch, chickling patch, are very good nitrogen fixers. Uh, things like the ostrich and winter pea, you see there in the photos. Um, the photo on the right there is just, is a picture of the, the nodules. Uh, produced by the Austrian winter bee. You know, that's a, to produce a tremendous amount, or fix a tremendous amount of nitrogen. Um, the legumes also tend to have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, so they're going to decompose a lot more rapidly in the system and recycle those nutrients. So again, that can be an important uh, point. They're also a lot more digestible compared to some of the grasses. All right, okay, next slide. We think about our grass cover crops. Most people are familiar with those. They're very easy to establish, easy to grow. Most people have grown them in the past. Whether we're talking warm season, cool season type species. Um, compared to some of the legume seeds, or maybe even some of the you know, specialized brassica type seeds, uh, the seed cost tends to be lower. So we can put them in the mixes, we can decrease the overall cost of the mix and the input cost of the seed these cover crops. And again, it, it can provide a significant amount of organic matter, especially those warm season type species. All right, next slide. When we think about the brassicas, again, um, very good 
the scavenging was nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil, recycling those. Uh, the photo there on the left was taken there in Idaho at one of their research sites, and very good at um, helping to suppress weeds as well as some of the insect and the nematode uh, type uh, pests. That's in the spring and late spring, and no weeds growing up that plot after that to grass the winter field. Uh, the photo there on the right is the oil seed radish. You know, uh, develops very quickly, grows very quickly. So when uh, you're planting later in the season, uh, that late summer, early fall time, time period, you can get a pretty significant amount of growth on some of the species like the radishes. Right, next slide. So again, kind of thank you from a livestock forage quality um, standpoint. I want to kind of put together just a generalized table here, kind of comparing across these four different uh, general categories of um, uh, species. When we think about legumes and protein, they're going to be high to very high in protein. Those cool season grasses are going to be somewhere in the middle, kind of medium to high. Warm season grasses are going to be on like kind of the low to medium side on the free protein. Look at the brassicas, they're going to be very similar to the legumes, kind of that high to very high free protein content. And look at the fiber, NDF component of, the, of these different species. Legumes are going to be kind of that low to medium category. Cool season grasses, medium. Warm seasons are going to be medium to high, so the higher the fiber, the less quality there is in the species. When we look at the brassicas, they're probably going to be the lowest of any of those four categories as far as the fiber content. So most of them, look at the digestibility, the digestibility of those brassicas is going to be very high, not a lot of fiber. Um, digestibility of the goo is going to be medium to high, cool season grasses, medium to high. Warm seasons are going to be on that low to medium side due to, due to that higher fiber content. Look at palatability. Good palatability is always good. Medium to high. Cool season grasses, palatability on those. Warm seasons tend to be again a little bit on that low to medium side. And then our brassicas. Because the brassicas are very high in quality, but they do contain some compounds that sometimes um, animals don't like as well and have to become accustomed to eating. So I kind of put that in kind of a medium to high category. So when you think about those warm season grasses, they're not uh, the highest quality, they're high in yield. So that's why we want to even consider those in some of these systems or in some of the mixes that we might put together. Okay, next slide. So let's just kind of, kind of go through some of the, the Idaho data that they shared with me, some of the cover crop trials. This is a photo of their site. Most of their sites were in kind of like South Central Idaho uh, country, so I think it has pretty good relation to our uh, environmental conditions here in Colorado. So this photo is a, you know, we've got some bees there in the foreground, some of the sorghums that they looked at the about 45 days ago. And they, they tend to be plant most of their cover crops in about that mid-October time, mid-August time period, which is probably just a little bit later than we should be planning in Colorado, especially when we look at it from a full forage production standpoint. Okay, next slide. So this is some of their initial uh, yields of some of the species and combinations that they looked at in 2012. So on the left side of the, the graph here, we have a number of the different uh, legumes they looked at. We need a uh, uh, spray bee, it's a spray bee. AWD is the Austrian winter bee, and the Austrian winter bee is with Triticale. Harry Vetch, Harry Vetch and Triticale mix. Cheap tickling Vetch is the next one. They also include a pasture pick, this is grasses, and this is a perennial mix, so not much productive that you can establish them. And on the right side of the graph, we have grasses. Triticale, cool season grass, Formos and grass hybrid, granola mixed with some winter wheat, some uh, warm season species, um, some hybrid sort of chicken grasses, those types of little vanilla. So, one thing I want to point out on this slide, uh, 
the key points, I think, is that mix legumes with one of those grasses like Drake Daily, we tend to increase the overall productivity. So again, we link to the advantages of some of these mixtures. It, the biggest um, the yielder there was that hairy mix and tree kale mix at about well, just under um, four and a half pounds to the acre. So planting in mid August, 54 growth, early time period, that's a tremendous amount of growth. All right, next slide. So we did have a little bit of data regarding both the 2012 yield, 2013 yield. Through there, you can feed them. You know, there's some variation from one year to the next. That top of there, that Arvika spring, that's kind of came to the top of them. And got a little bit of work with that particular species here in Colorado, and it ends up pretty well in Colorado as well. But again, um, five, uh, three, three and a half, five tons to, to the egg, that's just tremendous yield. So, um, it's variability, but uh, again, pretty good, some pretty good yields there. It's very cheap, it took a lot of production, some of the species. Next slide. When we look at the kind of the forage quality, we want to look at yield, but also look at the quality of these species. This one is the relative feed value. This is just a combination of the two fiber fraction, the anti, the neutral detergent fiber, and the acid detergent fiber components of the components. So the higher the number, the quality, the more digestible it's going to be. Okay. This last is the data from the Twin Falls site around Twin 
Paul Lennon up there. We also have a site in Tim County. This is on a producer's um, farm deal. Uh, basically, after the winter wheat, we came in and just pissed that down. So you got kind of a her back uh, um, photo. We had a lot of volunteer winter wheat came in after the planted. It wasn't the ideal situation.
right side, the kale is like it's a long season type crop. It could be 180 days to mature, so you probably need to fit eight something on the feet. Uh, turn up red hybrid that uh, are fairly well. The Swedes and one of the big tillage uh, uh, issues. Okay, next slide. We looked at this on two different seeding dates, uh, mid August, or mid July, and mid August. And we sampled both, uh, half the plot, mid October, the other half of the plot, mid November. Joe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually cut you off there. We're, we're barely catching you right now, and, and I apologize, this hasn't worked better. Uh, our first stunt at trying to Skype a speaker in. So I apologize, but I think we're going to cut you just a little bit short. We've